Ladies and gentlemen, as I announced in the introduction video, uh, in this module number one, we are focusing on the gendered impacts of mining operations. It means how the operations, the extractive operations are impacting on women differently. The objective of this course or this model is to help you to understand more what ASM is and learn more about how the impacts of mining projects are different on women. And finally, we'll try to see the reasons why women are excluded from the decision-making process in the extractive sector. So for that, we have organized the model into a couple of key points we'll be discussing throughout um, the next couple of minutes. We'll be reminding you first about the extractive governance sector in West Africa. This is a kind of overall overview of the sector. And then we'll come back on the specific points relating to artisanal and small scale mining, ASM. And try to look at the impacts of mining projects, whether they are industrial or artisanal mining, on women, sorry. So finally, we'll look at um, the reasons why women are excluded from the decision-making process in their extractive governance. So number one, the overview of extractive governance in West Africa. And as you know, Africa is very rich of natural resources. So around 30% of the world mineral reserves are from Africa. And this can provide a kind of enormous opportunity for economic growth for all those countries in sub-Saharan Africa. For now, for example, we know that the sector is accounting for over two thirds of the continent exports and even beyond for some countries, right? And significant share of total government revenues and gross domestic product. So which is a great opportunity for several African countries that are resource rich. But beside the industrial production, we have the artisanal and small scale mining that is a major source of income for millions of people in Africa as well. So the sub -Saharan, in the sub-Saharan Africa, ASM is providing important revenues, in particular in rural areas of more than 23 countries. So, but you have to know that where ASM is carried out, it is largely informal generally and even illegal activity in some countries. Um, so whereas some countries are trying to formalize it by developing laws and policies that can govern the sector. But overall, it is benefiting sometimes much to communities. But at the same time, it is the cause of, um, let's say, harmful practices um, to the environment, to the local ec ecosystem, etc. So that is reducing the potential of um, converting the mining sector into, let's say, a kind of economic opportunity. And particularly in Africa, a region which is really rich in natural resources, we uh, see a kind of paradox of abundance because those countries that are really rich in natural resources keep being very poor. So they are, have a kind of growing poverty in most of countries in the region. That's why we call it, um, let's say, a paradox of abundance. Also, we mentioned that the legal and policy framework is operating at different levels or at multiple levels of regulation. We have international policies and laws. We have at the continental level, for example, with the AMV, the Africa Mining Vision. At the sub-regional level in West Africa, ECOWAS have developed a strong framework, including directives, policies, and recently a model act in this extractive sector. At the national level also, each country has their own, let's say, legal different. We have the private sector, the government, civil society, and these are the main stakeholders operating in the sector. 
and sometimes also international organizations are joining in the governance area or ecosystem to contribute to transparency and accountability. So as we said, in all the phases, they have different, let's say, impacts that are, um, we can face, people are facing in the extractive sector. So whether the exploitation is industrial or artisanal at all levels, there are effects on the environment and on the health of people in several other areas this is impacting on people, but differently on women. So that's why this course will be focusing on gender issues in the extractive sector. But let's see what is artisanal and small scale mining ASF. What it is really? There is no standard definition of what ASM is, but a couple of things make up what we call ASM. One is referring to mining by individuals, not by industries or groups or families or cooperatives, without or with very minimal mechanization. Uh, so less machines in the sector. The second element that is key when we try to define what ASE is, is the informal sector. So in several countries, it is called an illegal activity. So less machines, illegal activity, and also it is this manual in several countries, in particular in West Africa, where this activity is really um, growing. So small scale mining or ASM is less mechanized than the industry. So in terms of comparison, for example, you would say that it's an activity with very less mechanization, sometimes manual activity in some countries led by individuals rather than companies or industries as we could see in the um, industrial exploitation. So um, artisanal mining has experienced explosive growth in recent years. If you compare the figures from, um, let's say 2013 or 2014 and to now, today we have around 40 million of people directly engaging in ASM. These are the figures in 2017. So these may have grown so during the last three or four years. So ASM is generally pursued as a route of out of poverty or let's say fast track development for some communities that are exploiting uh, this. So get rich quickly activity it is going in some countries, right? So with different impacts it may have on communities. But despite its low productivity, ASM is an important source of minerals and metals. It is accounting for about 20% of the global gold supply in the world. And the other kind of minerals also are accounting too much in the global supply in the world. So if you take the example of some countries, for example, like Mali, Burkina Faso, Senegal, this is accounting too much on the GDP and the exportations as well. So ASM is getting huge in the continent. So at a glance, we can see these figures or numbers, 40 million people working in ASM in 2017, more than 150 million people depending on ASM across 80 countries in the global south, including Latin America, Asia Pacific and Africa, et cetera. So these figures can make you understand how ASM is really important in the extractive sector. But ASM has huge impact also on environment, on health and safety of people. So um, it is a kind of large, oh, it's the source of the largest releases of mercury estimated at um, tons per year 
in, in several countries. So this is exposing people to mercury, serious health impacts, and, and damaging even the brain of some several people who are living around those projects as well. They, there are also high risk of security and safety using some chemical products around the activity of ASM. ASM also has social implications um, when it is, um, let's say, um, happening in a specific community. In Africa, it, it is really fueling conflicts and disagreements between the communities, but also it is making a kind of high or facilitating a high occurrence of prostitution around gold mines um, in this area. And it is changing also the beliefs of those communities or the values those communities used to have. And this is also a great source of crime and conflicts um, in, in several countries in West Africa. However, ASM has benefits that don't have only negative impacts. So we have to know that it is, as we announced, it's a kind of source of employment for several communities. We said that around 40 millions of people are working in this area and more than 150 millions of people are depending on the ASM, um, let's say, um, for positive impacts. For example, in Guinea alone, artisanal small scale mining revenues account for almost 16% of the expenditure on health, education, and water infrastructure. So that is very important to note as well. So when we try to compare ASM and large scale mining or artisanal and industrial mining, you can see that uh, in several countries, for example, ASM is illegal, it is informal compared to um, the industrial sector. But the most important thing to note here is about how these two are interacting. In several countries, they are operating in the same area or in the same zones. So that's why, let's say, some literature is thinking that separating those operation zones would be important to avoid some conflicts between um, LSM and ASM. So that is important to mention. So some countries um, have still informal, let's say, policies on this, or they didn't develop at all any policy or legal framework to govern the sector. So informality brings along damage to socioeconomic health and environmental impacts. It is not formalized in, in several countries in Africa, but in particular. So for, for that, some, some, let's say, governments or institutions have made great suggestions on how this could be formalized by developing legal frameworks, and whether for licensing or for access to funding for those who are operating in this sector, or in terms of support for technical um, let's say machines so that it can be more formalized and more regulated. So overall, let's know that ASM is underregulated and for several reasons, including access to land, etc., and the use of chemical products. So that's why the ILO, the International Labor Organization, has developed great literature on that to understand more why some countries are still reluctant to, uh, let's say, uh, formalize or regulate the sector. So over the centuries, ASM has been a significant source of income for rural and impoverished individuals in Africa. So more recently, the industry has made an important contribution to mineral wealth and foreign nations earnings as well. And when you come back to the ECOWAS community or the West Africa countries, and we can know that more than five to six countries, um, we can notice that um, ASM is, let's say, utilizing several people as employment. So it is providing um, jobs to several communities. But what the impacts are, what the impacts of these mining projects are on women? Because we, as we said at the beginning, the impacts on women are really different from those impacts on men, even if both of them are facing these impacts. 
Um, so we said that both industrial and artisan and small scale mining operations impact differently and women and girls. So when we say women, please consider also girls as part of that group. So let's start by the industrial operations and see how these impact on women. First of all, they impact on their land, livelihood, and food security, as we said in the the, the first course on the fundamentals of natural resource governance. So in many rural contexts, women are responsible for growing food or collecting firewood, they will forest plant fruits and herbs, etc. But when mining companies arrive, they affect first the land because uh, women will be losing the land and their livelihood. That is the first, let's say, impact women are facing in this sector. And secondly, the sector is affecting the health of all people, including women, but it is really visible on women due to the absorption of the chemical substances uh, to which men are exposed when women are exposed uh, in this area. But also, uh, women is specific physiologies at different life stages from childhood, growth, menstruation, pregnancy, and their physical percentage of body fat, weight, the ability to absorb and retain nutrition and affect women's susceptibility to diseases as well. So the sector has impacts on women's health as well. In terms of safety and security as well, women are facing, let's say, harassment, human trafficking, uh, prostitution. So the presence of mining companies in an area, in a rural area, is coming with different other, let's say, impacts, including sex crimes, rape, etc. So these are the main impacts people are, or especially women are facing in this reproductive sector. But also unpaid work. Unpaid work is really huge in these areas where mining operations are happening. Women will be taking care of the families, but at the same time, they are not getting paid for any work they are doing around that. But also, the gender dynamics or the power dynamics within the communities which are hosting the mining operations also are really visible when the operations start. So this is a kind of growing cash economy in this context, and this is going to they say undermine women's rights, but undermine also women's possibility to be engaged in the decision-making processes. And the arsenal operations also have impacts on women. And in addition to those we have seen or caused by the industrial operations, the ASM is adding also other impacts on women and very negative impacts on women. And some of them relate to the economic challenges. So traditional norms prohibit women from access, use, and control over the land and other productive resources. This is really documented in several, um, let's say, reports, and there is a huge literature on that as well. So as women are prohibited to access to those let's say, opportunities as well. So they are kept in the dark about the extent of actual minerals mined. So they don't also, uh, let's say, take part to the, or they don't participate at all in the decision-making process. Uh, but the other thing is, even if they are, uh, let's say, having access to land, the other difficulty is that they can't access to financial opportunities from the loans the banks could provide to people that are operating in this sector. So this is a kind of other discrimination from women related to economic challenges as well. And the, the, the other discrimination women are facing is relating to the legal and institutional uh, framework. Policy level, there are discrimination laws or policies against women, often that put them at a low order in policies, decisions that affect them as well. And um, this is not only specific to Africa, it used to be specific to several other, let's say, areas in the world as well. 
Um, the, the, the other impact ASM is having on women is related to the lack of participation in decision making. Women regularly face exclusion when key issues are discussed in association. They are not consulted. They are not informed um, when operations are happening in a, a specific area, in particular in Africa, due to several other reasons, including and let's say historical and traditional um, barriers, which we are going to see in depth in the next, let's say, a couple of slides. So those reasons why women are excluded and generally are historical. So historically, there are kind of socialist stereotypes that only men can work in risky and difficult environments. So which is undermining the capacities or the capabilities of women to be, let's say, considered in the extractive sector significantly. Uh, we have also, as we said, legal frameworks that are very discriminatory against women. So even in the 19th century, for example, in the UK, they used to have very clear provisions that prohibit women and young people to work or girls to work in underground mines, for example. So these are examples of discriminatory legislative frameworks. But also the new legal and policy framework, uh, the recent one, are really gender blind. They don't really consider women in, in the destructive in the sector. Uh, we have also cultural bias um, that prevent women to have uh, let's say, strong access or significant access to the resources um, in the mining area. These are cultural or traditional factors that undermine women participation to the decision-making mechanisms. Um, so that means women cannot decide or cannot make decisions as well. We mentioned the unpaid labor um, and time limitations due to that unpaid labor. Unpaid domestic labor primarily conducted by women requires a large amount of time and effort so that women cannot even have sufficient time to participate to the decision-making processes, even if they were given the possibility. And finally, the lack of access to critical resources, as I mentioned it, women, as they don't own the land, they don't control the land, generally they don't have any let's say, guarantee to uh, have a kind of loans from the banks that could be supporting that. Also, inequal access to education. Um, gender inequalities in access to education beyond primary school undermine fair access for women and girls to those opportunities, including employment opportunities or the participation to the decision-making processes as well. So these are the couple of things I wanted to share with you in this first model about the impacts of um, ASM on women. And we have provided a um, very long reading list you can have access for this model. Just click on the links so that you can have access to those uh, sources or so that you can deepen your understanding of this. So as I mentioned, this is a kind of very live discussion we want to have around this course. If you have experiences, if you have questions and comments, please share them in the forum so that we can contribute to enhance more understanding, but also more engagement of all those participants to foster women's rights in the destructive sector. Thank you so much.